What's going on, everybody? It's your buddy, it's your pal, Spaz Phoenix, the YWC Reality Check. And yes, on the day we got justice for Johnny, on the day that they will all remember as the day that they almost got Captain Jack Sparrow, this is your Dynamite Review for June 1st, 2022. And yes, I had to start with that because facts don't care about your feelings. Moving swiftly, swiftly on, how about we talk about Double or Nothing? How cool was Double or Nothing? How long was Double or Nothing? Um... Interesting show going into tonight's show because the first time in California and they had a bunch of reps there and Roddy Roddy Ra. So you were expecting some stuff to to go down right before the show started. I uh, was seeing some stuff online, obviously, because they do dark or elevation or those uh, those shows that I don't watch because wrestling shouldn't give you homework. And there was a better stage setup for this week's episode of Dynamite than there was for the pay per view, and that's weird. I do like the uh, the LED long ramp that they use occasionally because it does have a cool effect. I do like when they um, backlight and back screen the the trademark whatever you want to call them AEW uh, heel and babyface tunnels, and I don't know why, but for some reason I like the lower. Titantron, because uh, everything was pretty low to the ground, and I think it was just tarped off in behind. Um, but I just found it really, really weird that they had a they had a unique special stage for tonight, but they had pretty much the generic dynamite stage for Double or Nothing. And that's not to say anything bad. I just found it a bit odd. So what was going to happen tonight? Were we going to see MJF tonight? What was the new champion going to do and say and whatever? And what were we going to do towards Forbidden Door, Closed Door, Locked Door, Open Door gimmick? pay-per-view that's in like a month. Um, I will say it's it's a unique situation AEW's in right now, and I, I can't take credit for this. This was mentioned on uh, on What Culture a couple times on a preview that I was listening to earlier today. Um, because their pay-per-views are spaced out so weird and we only get four a year and all that kind of thing, it is weird for them to have a post-pay-per-view show that's immediately going into another into another pay-per-view. Now, I get that it's different. I get that they have to look at this sort of the same way WWE looks at Survivor Series, where it's like, okay, we've got to set up some stuff just for this show, and then we got to get back to our stuff. Um, but it is still, you know, we finished one, we're already on to the next, and the first segment is going to prove that. The first segment was new AEW World Heavyweight Champion CM Punk and the ROH Tag Team Champions FTR taking on Max Caster and the Gun Club. Now, Anthony Bowens is still injured, which is terrible, but he's still part of the entrance, which is good. Billy Gunn is having a little too much fun at the moment with this, uh, with the scissoring thing. That's just fine. Now, I will say, before we get onto this, apparently there was some CM Punk and FTR stuff after the cameras stopped rolling at the pay-per-view where they were carrying him around and they were all, they all had their belts and whatever. Somebody turned this into a t-shirt that said, The Sons of Bret Hart. That's a bit weird. I don't know whether that was, that obviously didn't have anything to do with AEW or even like pro wrestling tees, but I saw it floating around, uh, floating around Twitter around Monday, Tuesday time, and that's a bit weird. I get that they all pay respect and pay tribute and all that, but eh, Sons of Bird, it's a bit weird. But I will say, Max Caster obviously dropped into one of his raps that I'm going to make you all pay like Amber Heard, which is fucking phenomenal. Let her divvy up, uh, what is it, $15 million to Johnny's $2 million? I'm going to call that a win. Along with the congrats Johnny signs that I saw in the crowd more than once. Now, what does the match prove? The match proves that the champions are good at being champions and that the uh, the Gun Club are really, really good at getting their asses kicked. Uh, FTR teased forever the ta the tag to CM Punk, and it worked. He got a huge pop. This match went a little too long for me. Uh, now, if it was FTR taking on the Acclaimed, who I really like, uh, that would be a different story. But it's them and CM Punk taking on one of the Acclaimed and Billy's kids, who are, let's face it, a jobber team. Um, really, really funny moment where there was a stare down between CM Punk and Billy Gunn, and the really bad, really wrong part of my brain kind of wants to see that match. I don't know. I, I, the visual in my head of CM Punk getting Billy Gunn, like big jacked up Billy Gunn, 
up for a GTS kind of makes me smile. GTS into a big rig, get the win for Punk and FTR. Um, as they're celebrating, there's another sign that I saw in the crowd that says Summer of Punk 2022, and that made me smile. Uh, Punk gets on the microphone, he says, I've never done a drug in my life, but I imagine that that's what these feel like. Uh, I am the champion, I gotta, I gotta learn, I gotta get better, that's what being a champ means, but you can call me the champion. Dax puts over wrestling and how the only things that he loves more than wrestling is his kids and his wife and all that sort of thing, and he puts over ROH, which is really good, and then they make reference to, and I'm sorry I've forgotten their name, but the two guys that jumped them last week, he basically says, anybody from any company that wants to step up, please step up, and then they make a random, they make a random reference to Finley, which we're not going to get to again until the end of the show. Um... Punk grabs the microphone yet again. He's like, well, it's time to sell the next pay-per-view, which is absolutely what it was. Um, calls out New Japan. He says, I know there's somebody in the back that wants to face me. Who do I got? And this is where the drum roll doesn't really do me any good because I'm not familiar with New Japan, as you guys know. There's a reason I have Guapo on here co-hosting most of the previews with me these days. Uh, and it's Hiroshi Tanahashi, who I know by name. And if you put me at gunpoint right now and said, have you ever seen a Hiroshi Tanahashi match? I'd be like... I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, but apparently, he like I, this is where I throw myself on the mercy of the court, so to speak, uh, and say, you guys got to correct me if I'm wrong on this shit, but is he their champion at the moment? Are they doing the very simple story of champion versus champion? I know a lot of people wanted um, CM Punk versus Kenda just for the go to sleep thing. Um, I don't know if, hey, we have this, hey, the last time we did, hey, we have the same finisher, let's fight. Wasn't that in WCW with uh, Bret Hart and Sting? Yeah, how did that go? That should have been great, but, you know, it is what it is. So that's the first match announced for Forbidden Door. So that's cool. We got the main event already sorted in. If it is champion versus champion, I'm sure 101 Roman Reigns jokes will be made in the very, very near future. MJF comes out, cuts off the music right away. Um, basically tries to do the, C like, the angry, yelling, non-censored AEW version of the pipe bomb. He comes out, he says he's in a lot of pain, but hey, all you people just pay to hear me talk anyway. This isn't MJF, this is Max Friedman talking to you. He was trying to have his own, like, hey, my real name is Joe moment. Um, you know, you got a lot of representatives tonight here in California. It would be a shame if something happened to the show. It's too little, too late. Nobody here is on my level. I carried the company on my back for months. I don't want to be here. You guys aren't fans. You're marks. He knocks New Japan. He knocks the Indies. He knocks Flippy Shit. He knocks Tony Khan. Would Tony Khan treat me better if I was an ex-WWE guy? And he looks down the microphone. He looks out of the ring, down at the camera, down the down the camera lens, and says, I want you to fire me. And then they cut off the mic, just like WWE cut off the mic at the end of Punk's Pipe Bomb at the appropriate time. And apparently, apparently during the commercial break, CM Punk and a couple other people came and chased him out of the arena. And they did their best with this, didn't they? They made a point of not mentioning it for the rest of the show and all that kind of thing. And when they came back from the commercial break, they immediately uh, recapped what had happened in the first match and not in that segment. So they're kind of trying to say, oh, you know, we better get past this, we better get past this. You know, like Chris Rock trying to get on with the Oscars after he was assaulted by Will Smith. Oh, yes, they did a pretty decent job of that. But let's, let's be real. MJF is awesome. Don't get me wrong. Here's the thing. You got MJF over as a babyface, sort of, in this promo. People were chanting for him after the after the, uh, after the promo was over. Here's the thing, and here's the thing. Where is the logic? Because Max, in real life, you know, there's the story about him walking out and not coming to the pay-per-view and walking out on a signing and all that kind of thing and whatever. But if we're trying to now make this a storyline where it's him versus the establishment like CM Punk or Austin taking on Vince McMahon, it's not going to work because people have Tony Khan's cock deep in their mouths. So they're not going to hate along with, but they're going to like that he's doing the WWE thing while taking shots at WWE. It was an awesome promo. Don't get me wrong. It's only after the fact that I point out, like, it actually doesn't make any sense to turn your best heel into a babyface who's only babyfacing against the babyface owner. Don't know about that. 
Like I say, delivery, awesome. Promo, awesome. Intensity, awesome. Owns the microphone. Every time he every time he drops WWE into a promo, he looked like he was orgasming just a little bit. But it breaks if you think about it for even a second. <laughs> Which is really unfortunate because whatever it turns into, I'm going to enjoy. Whether, you know, I don't want to do the old Hogan thing. It was a work. It was a shoot. It was a work. And you worked yourself into a shoot. Cool. If they're going to roll with it, let's roll with it. They, they, they have clearly decided to take him fully away from Wardlow now that, uh, now that that story is over, which is fine. So he needs to do something new. And if he's going to yell at his boss for a while, well, that's fine. We got Johnny Elite who showed up again tonight and he signed uh, an open-ended contract to face anybody in AEW. Translation, they're going to use that to introduce somebody new or bring back somebody that's been gone a while. And it was Miro, which is fine, which is totally cool, totally awesome, and that sounds really patronizing, I know. But he he's in the back and he cuts his weird god promo, I was gone for a while, but now I'm going to redeem everybody that doesn't know what's best for them, and rah de ra de ra de ra Miro, God, my wife is hot, promo. Johnny Elite gets smoked in the match, he gets like one kick in and then he gets owned for a while, there's a springboard in Siguri by him and some running knees, pump kick by Miro and the game over gets the win, which is... Fine, I suppose. And then we get a video recap of the Anarchy in the Arena match from Sunday, which I will say it here and I will say it now, and this is what's going to get me in a lot of shit, and this is what's going to get me a lot of hate from a lot of people. I've had a problem for a very long period of time now with Eddie Kingston, which is bad because I went through a period of time, if you guys listen to my preview with Guapo, you'll know I talked about it then as well. Eddie Kingston used to be one of my favorite things to watch on the show, dude was really intense, you could take him seriously, da 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 Then he ramped it up from 10 to 11, he turned into a cartoon character, and he never came back. That happened in this match, where all the craziness was going on. I love, side note, side note I love the, the, the little extra step of, we didn't stop Moxley's music until Jericho busted up the soundboard. I thought that was, that was a very cool little thing for them to do. But, you know, they brawl through the back, they brawl through the front, and, you know, he did his, his little emo, oh my god, Jericho, you've made me drink, and then they blurred out the Jack Daniels label on the thing, and I'm like, that's, uh, it's really campy, and you're, you're going for, like, amateur, amateur drama class type stuff, and then he stumbles down to the ring looking like a goddamn zombie after he's been shot at with mustard, because he's got a gas can with him, and he's gonna light Jericho on fire, except here's the thing, and here is the thing. You guys know I've got absolutely no love for Michael Sidgwick and What Culture. I think What Culture is one of the better, sort of more balanced, definitely more fun content creators when it comes to talking about wrestling. I could aspire to be like most of them one day, but I'm also an asshole. You got Michael Sidgwick who doesn't like anything. He doesn't like fun. He doesn't like sex. He doesn't like. <laughs> he hasn't touched the grass in 20 years. It's fine. But he makes a great point all the time about Drew McIntyre. Drew McIntyre who's pretty awesome in WWE, who helped carry them through the COVID era and still hasn't gotten what he deserved out of that deal. But he's got the thing with the sword, and he has the sword, and he puts the sword up in the air, and it does the pyro, and he's got the sword with him at ringside, and he goes and he swings it at people. And that's pretty fucking useless, because it's live pro wrestling, and you're not going to decapitate somebody. Well, here's the deal, and here's the deal. For how intense uh, Eddie Kingston wants us to believe he is, and he's going to put a hit on somebody, except he's he's just not, because you're not going to kill somebody in wrestling unless your name is Rey Mysterio or Sasha Banks. Um, so coming down with the gas can and splashing it all around and all the Amdram stuff, don't bring down the sword if you're not going to cut somebody's head off. Don't bring down the gas can if you're not going to burn somebody alive. And you're not going to burn somebody alive because it's live wrestling, you fucking Amdram bobble-headed cunt. <laughs> I'm sorry. Eddie Kingston went from one of the being one of the best things on the show to one of the worst things on the show. And when you consider that Cody Rhodes used to be on this show, that definitely says something. That's all I got, which is super unfortunate. And I want to bring this back around to this point as well. That's super unfortunate because the rest of this match was really, really fun. A lot of really, really needless spots of, like, you're gonna die and the camera might not even catch it because there's five separate brawls going on. I don't know what happened when they lock Garcia in the elevator, except he came back out to celebrate at the end, and the Jericho team got the win, which is good. Um, 
And also, although people make fun of this in WWE, oh my god, can they get along? What ultimately led to their downfall was Kingston and Danielson fighting with each other over the fact that he's not going to set a human being on fire because it's live fucking wrestling. Anyways, so the Jericho Appreciation Society come out, they brag about being the winners of Double or Nothing, and they do the Appreciate Us thing, like the Acknowledge Me Roman Reigns thing, which is cool, and then they call themselves the Princes of Pape. Now, this is good, this works because it's an obnoxious gimmick. Now... We all think it's hysterical that WWE has gone from calling them pay-per-views to calling them premium live events or PLEs, and that's not ever going to get into the zeitgeist. I'm sure they're going to uh, they're going to get rid of that eventually. But if you are one of the obnoxious people in podcasts, on YouTube, in conversation, etc., that think it's cool and nifty and trendy and new to shorten pay-per-view to pape, end yourself. Just. Pull your lip over your head and swallow, as Walter Matthau would say. And then you got Jericho doing the obvious sarcasm of, What kind of man tries to burn another man alive? Kingston comes out with Regal, because nobody else is there. And they get they try to get Regal to do the war games, except it's blood and guts. And it doesn't, it doesn't work at all. I appreciate the attempt, but that's about it. While Kingston is out on the ramp saying that, hey, like, I don't have very many people here with me right now, but I'll take you on five on one. Ortiz comes from the back and cuts Jericho's hair. Jericho agrees to blood and guts if he can have a hair versus hair match with Ortiz. And here's the thing, once again, this stuff is all very sports entertainment. That's the whole point of the Jericho Appreciation Society is to take a shot at sports entertainment. Here's the thing. AEW will make fun of WWE for doing sports entertainment, but they've created a sports entertainment faction so that they can do sports entertainment as well. It's fine that they've done that. It's fine that they found themselves a little loophole to do all the things that they make fun of the other company for doing. Just acknowledge that that's what they've done. And you need a guy like Jericho to pull that off. Just like there's a whole lot of stuff on WWE that wouldn't work unless it was Sami Zayn or Kevin Owens doing it. You know, the Canadians, we, we bring a lot to the table. How about you give us some more belts? So yeah, we're going to get Jericho versus Ortiz, hair versus hair, in two weeks. And then I think in four weeks we're getting blood and guts, which is fine. Kingston will get out there and cut another, please guys, please think I'm tough, promo. Uh, I'm scared of myself, I don't know what I'll do staring at my hands like Gargano in the depths of uh, good NXT. That's about it. Um, in the back, Jay Lethal and his friends beat up Samoa Joe's arm again, which is fun, <laughs> I guess. That's going to happen eventually. I said it at the, on the preview, and I'm going to say it again now. It's kind of troubling that they got all the ROH belt. I mean, they pick up the ROH property, and they're going to do something with it, and they've been very honest that they don't know what they're doing with it quite yet. They're trying to get it a TV deal or a streaming deal or whatever the case may be. I will be interested in whatever they do. Don't get me wrong, but they acquired the property. They did a pay-per-view. They got all the belts on all the new people that they want holding them. Um, Samoa Joe, Wheeler Yuta, Jonathan Gresham, um, FTR, Mercedes Martinez, etc., 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 but, um, they didn't have any matches. On, like, there was a couple of things you could have kicked off that pay-per-view and given FTR a title defense on the show. Or Mercedes Martinez, for that matter. That being said, Jonathan Gresham, the current ROH world champion, is going to be at the next Destiny show that I'm at. And the next Destiny show that I'm at is free because it's taking place in the middle of the pizza festival in Vaughan, Ontario, and I'm going to see Jonathan Gresham wrestle for free while everybody else eats pizza because pizza can fuck off. That's a little note out of my personal life that I'm sure you guys were super, super interested in, but the bigger point here is feature your ROH champion. The only, like, you were featuring Samoa Joe because, hey, look, we're AEW and we have Samoa Joe, but you put him in the Owen tournament where he wasn't defending the title. Now he's going to do this thing with Jay Lethal, but now he's got, like, Great Kali 2.0 with him and Sanjay Dutt, who could be good, but right now it's just annoying. And, yes, I'm aware that that is the point. Leave it out of the comment section below. Um, big old clusterfuck match next was supposed to be the Young Bucks Red Dragon and Adam Cole versus the Hardys, the, the Jurassic Express, and Christian Cage. Now, Adam Cole was taken out of the match because he's injured, apparently. Jeff Hardy was taken out of the match because he's injured. Apparently, Jeff named Darby Allen as his replacement. And Adam Cole picked Hikaleo. 
Now, I, th I think this is fucking hysterical, because yes, they're building up the New Japan thing, I get that. But not only, oh, they borrowed Hikaleo from New Japan, and they, they were only able to get him because, you know, Adam Cole's friends with Jay White, which is fine, I'm pretty sure Jay White will be on the open door gimmick pay-per-view thing there. But the thing is, I watch Jay White and the Bullet Club, including Hikaleo, on Impact, so they're not New Japan guys to me. I know that that's sacrilege, and I know that that's not even true, but I'm just giving you guys my point of view on that one. Uh, Cole's on commentary with his brand new Owen Hart Championship trophy belt thing. Nice little moment, I will say, on the pay-per-view. Um, right before Julia Hart turned heel, you had two heels win the two Owen Hart Memorial Cup Thing, whatever. Martha Hart was out there. She gave a great speech. It was a nice, lovely moment. I'm not going to take the piss out of it. Um, they, they had the trophy. They both got presented with the belts. The belts are fucking gorgeous. Let's put that one out there. Um, but yeah, Adam Cole is on there with the belt on commentary watching the match. It's a big pile of people match, so I don't have a ton of notes. Uh, Jungle Boy hit a leapfrog Rana from the uh, fur. Sorry. A leapfrog Rana off of the apron to the floor at one point. Luchasaurus... Uh, has a prolonged big man steamroller segment in the match. There's a uh, Canadian Destroyer off the back of Luchasaurus by Jungle Boy. Uh, Hikaleo at one point, who's a big fucking dude, let's, let, let's not skip over that part, goes for a dive and lands straight on his fucking heed, and he was up like 10 seconds later dropping somebody else. So, really hoping that that wasn't just adrenaline, that he is actually okay, but that was a little bit of a scary moment. Spear off the apron by Christian, which was which was fine. Meltzer driver by the box on Jungle Boy gets the win. Um, let's see. How, how sick of the Bucks was I for a long-ass time? I was so sick of the Bucks that I was comparing them to Sasha Banks, who's never coming back to WWE, according to some people, and oh, oh, be still my broken heart, except it's not broken at all. It's actually starting to heal. Um, I went from that comparison to them being associated with the Undisputed Era, or the former Undisputed Era, I should say, uh, I wouldn't be that against them picking up the belts again and putting over somebody else. Bucks versus the Acclaimed uh, for the titles somewhere down the line would be great. Bucks, I said before, before Blackpool Combat Club was a thing, I said, give me John Moxley and Eddie Kingston before he was a bobblehead versus the Bucks and, you know, beautiful graphic pro wrestling violence would ensue. Uh, I still want to see that match, I'm just not saying it as hatefully as I used to. Um, match was good. Um, for, a, for a pile of people match that can just be, okay, you do a move, okay, I do a move, okay, you do a move, okay, I do a move, it did, it did putter along quite well. It's just, I'll be completely honest, guys, taking, taking notes on a match where there's 10 people in the ring, one guy on the outside in the form of Brandon Cutler and Adam Cole adding his two cents on commentary, plus the sort of kind of debut of Hikaleo and the last minute insertion of Darby Allen. There's a lot. So there's stuff in this segment that I have not mentioned. You guys can tell me down in the comment section below. I'm not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but we'd be here forever if I talked about all of it. Um... It was interesting to see Kyle O'Reilly and, and Darby Allen throughout the course of the match find each other after their match on uh, on Double or Nothing as well. Tony Schiavone is on the ramp de uh, interviewing the debuting. Debuting the interviewing was what I was about to say because it's tired in here. Uh, Tony on the ramp. In uh, ah, why can't I speak? That's fucking terrible. Introducing for an interview, the newest member of the AEW women's roster, Athena. There we go. Thank you, brain. Full words make full sentences. Um, she's here. It's no secret why she's here. They've got the best women's roster, including a very dominant TBS champion, and she calls out Jade Cargill, and she says she's going to break her streak. Jade comes out with the badly with the baddies and Stokely Hathaway, who we also saw on Sunday. Malcolm Bivens, Stokely Hathaway, whatever they're going to call him. I don't think they actually called him out by name. Uh, on the show, if they did, I missed it. Um, basically, he did the, eh, we'd love to do that, but not now. Anna Jay and Chris Statlander come out uh, to back up Athena. I'm going to have to get used to stop calling her Ember Moon. I'm sure that on the way to Athena getting her shot at Jade Cargill, we are going to get that six-woman tag, which won't hurt my feelings in the slightest, but please, for the love of everything, let Athena save that title 
from Jade Cargill, because Jade Cargill is... Everybody in the Jade Cargill thing. Red Velvet, Kira Hogan, now Stokely Hathaway, Athena, Chris Statlander, Anna Jay, all of them deserve something better to do and something better to be rotating around than Jade Cargill, who's pretty poo. Let's be real. Uh, later on in the night, it's announced that on Rampage, Athena is going to debut against Kira Hogan. Kira Hogan needs to get a spotlight on her as well. Because, as I said, and I will keep saying it, when I started wa getting back into watching Impact, I liked Fire and Flavor, but she was the she was the Jeff. She was the Sean of that team. And then she, her partner went off and got another partner, and they're just not as good anymore. And now she's playing number two to Jade Cargill, who is a big number two. Let's, let's be real. Um, but I can't wait to see Athena on Rampage taking on taking on Kira Hogan. Now, if it wasn't for the fact that Jade Cargill is the one with the belt, I would say I'm actually looking more forward to watching her wrestle Kira Hogan because they'll actually probably let her hit an eclipse on Friday, which would be really, really good. Now, I've also, I also do want Statlander to get into a title pitcher, whether it's this one, whether it's the main women's champion. Statlander versus, uh, versus uh, Thunder Rosa would be really, really good, would it not? Hold on one second, please. And we're back. Don't you just love technology? So, uh, probably going to try and wrap this up pretty goddamn quickly after my excitement about Athena there. Um, next up, what did we have? We had the brand new AEW signing. It's Wardlow beating the shit out of JD Drake. Now, I don't know what they're doing here with his entrance because they did the whole, like, silent thing, like him walking through the empty halls, down the ramp, out the tunnel, uh, down the rampway, about halfway down the ramp. He then had music that sounded like his old music. I don't know whether that was a delay or a, or whether it was supposed to be a dramatic, ha-ha, I have music again. But uh, that part of it was weird. But, I mean, it's J.D. Drake, and we all know what he's there to do. He got in two chops, and then he died. He got pinned after two power bombs, and... Tony was going to uh, get up there and interview Wardlow, you know, congratulations, Wardlow is all elite. Uh, Smart Mark Sterling came out with some uh, legal documents saying that he's suing Wardlow, suing Wardlow on behalf of the Union of Arena Security Guards. He had one of the security guards give him the papers, serve him with the papers, and that, that, uh, that security guard got what all the other security guards have gotten, and then he got fed the, the legal papers, which is fucking great. Uh, we get the announcement that Scorpio Sky is going to defend the TNT Championship this coming Friday against the Walking Armband, and the Walking Armband tried to be intimidating backstage and failed. Oh, yes. Britt Baker, Jamie Hayter taking on Tony Storm and Ruby Soho. I almost said Ruby Riot there, so you'll have to excuse me. Now, with the... Uh do, 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 do. What was I going to say? With the exception of Chris Statlander, here's all the women... Okay, with the exception of Chris Statlander and Athena, here's all the women that I want lined up for title shots against both the titles in the next little while. Give me Thunder Rosa or Jade Cargill defending against Britt Baker, Tony Storm, Ruby Soho, Athena... Uh, Ruby... Ru ah. Ah, fuck, Jamie Hayter. Throw Jamie Hayter in the mix. I don't know where Rebel Not Reba, Rebel Not Rebel is, but that's fine. Britt Baker's coming out with the other Owen Hart Championship belt because, you know, they're a couple. They had nice matching belts, and it was all fine and wonderful. Um, the match was what it was. I, the match was good. The match got time. The match got a good reception from the crowd. I just don't... I, there, it's not a whole lot to write home about that just four really good wrestlers had a really good wrestling match. There was a, a stiff, neck, eh, stiff neck breaker, it's late in the day here, uh, off the apron to the floor by Baker, and then uh, a DDT off the apron by Hayter, as if they were mimicking each other, but not quite. And in between those two maneuvers, I did see the sign on the hard camera side that says, I have an appointment with Dr. Britt Baker DMD, and that made me smile. Tornado butterfly suplex from the second rope by Britt was awesome, but the, after a bunch of back and forth with Ruby Soho, Ruby Soho Soho hits the destination unknown, which is like, uh, I think uh, somebody else calls it the Blade Runner, uh, but it's called the destination unknown. I don't know what to tell you. Soho and Storm get the win, and there's a post-match assault with the Owen Hart belt. Uh, I saw some people uh, online complaining that these things that are supposed to represent Owen Hart uh, are being used as weapons already, and it's only been a week, rah, 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 rah. These are the same people that agree with Eddie Kingston that 
you know, Sammy Guevara was having sex with Brody Lee's belt when it's not Brody Lee's belt, and these people make my brain hurt. Um, unfortunately, the main event is, is pretty self-explanatory. <laughs> it's Daniel Garcia versus Moxley. Now, this is pretty cool, and there's some cool symmetry here, because these guys first fought each other on at the first dance when they introduced CM Punk for the first time. Now, the night or sorry, a couple nights after CM Punk wins the championship, they're fighting again under very different circumstances. Isn't that cool? They're on the opposite sides of this big-ass battle that we already know is going to be blood and guts. But they beat the hell out of each other. Mox gets busted open early. You've got William Regal on commentary explaining that Moxley has a couple staples or a couple stitches, I don't remember which, in his head. you got Jericho on uh, commentary as well, bickering back and forth with Regal, which is awesome. you got Moxley, and I swear to God, they, they have... They have a, a secret fetish in AEW for the side of the steel steps because Moxley not only hit the X-Plex, which always makes me mark out because it makes me think of Pete Dunne before Pete Dunne became Bush, but he hit the X-Plex on the jagged edge of the side of the steel steps. Pulling pile driver by Garcia that transfers into a sharpshooter that got transferred into some weird modified sharpshooter. Jericho, Jericho goes down to try and interfere. She get he Sorry, he gets interrupted by Eddie Kingston, who looks drunk, if I'm honest. Mox chokes out Garcia with the bulldog choke, and then everything just ends. The commentators thank TBS for letting them run over, because apparently they ran over. I don't know. I was watching it a bit late. And then they run down Friday. Friday, we're getting the Bucks versus the Lucha Brothers. That doesn't hurt my feeling at all. Like I said, Athena is debuting against Kira Hogan, which should be awesome, and Scorpio Sky is hopefully going to beat the living shit out of the walking armband. Now, next week... Next week, however, and this is where another one of those, oh my god, this such and such person from New Japan, and it's like, okay, but I've been seeing them wrestle on Impact for a while now. It's uh, David Finley's going to take on Hangman Page for reasons? I don't know. Um, the show was a lot of fun. I don't like. I come to the I come to the main event and I have the least to say about it because anything I could say about this I would have said when there was the Jericho promo earlier on in the night. So overall, they did a lot. They've got at least one match already set up for the open door gimmick pay per view. There, um, we've pr proceeded with a bunch of stuff. We know we're getting Athena's. Um, Athena's debut, like proper in ring debut, this coming Friday, which I believe is a live rampage. Um, yeah, we got the return of Miro, we got Johnny Elite on the show again, which I know divides opinion, and that's that's fine, that's wonderful, that's whatever. Um, good show. Overall, I, depending on how my weekend goes, I might spit out a Rampage review for the first time in a while, because those three ma well, two out of those three matches are really, really interesting. And uh, as a little bit of a side note, if you disagree with me on the Johnny Depp Amber Heard thing, then do me a favor. I don't have a lot of followers. I can't afford to lose a whole lot of followers. But if you disagree with me on shit like this, go ahead and fuck yourself. I've been Spaz, your YWC reality check. Subscribe up there. Talk down there. Start a conversation. Keep all these conversations going. Don't be a stranger. I will talk to each and every last one of you later. But for right now, I am tagging out. Bye, guys.